Thank you all for being here on our October reading at, of the Milwaukee Poetry Series at uh, St. John the Evangelist. I was talking about the schedule a little bit earlier, and you know in our season, our season of 10 readings, our first five are here through January at St. John the Evangelist. And the, uh, the library, the new library we're getting, which I'm going to say a word about in just a minute, is going to be ready after the first of the year and in February, starting with Greg Simon's reading, the last five are going to be in, in our new library, our brand new letting library that we have been working on uh, for years. So uh, welcome to the reading tonight. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we're very uh, excited about it. I think you've all seen the refreshments. So if you didn't get a cup of tea and you want a cup of tea or you want some refreshments, I would say uh, now is the time uh, to get it. Uh, we do have broadsides of one of Matthew's poems, and I think people got them as they came in. But if you didn't, Jane will, Jane will get one for you. We want to thank Bev Spurgeon, who is our, our videographer uh, tonight. So can we give Bev a little hand, please? Because thank you very much for doing that. Uh, I was telling Matthew that the, the videos do play on uh, Milwaukee Cable Access. Uh, I was delighted about five or six months ago when they told me that we, we are one of their most requested programs on cable access. So, uh, I, well, but it is, it is a case where people are calling up and saying, when are the Milwaukee Poetry Series playing? And what is the schedule? So that's very, uh, I mean, even if it's just a few people, I mean, that's very gratifying to hear. So that, that is happening, and uh, I got a chance to uh, pass that on. Several, yes, Andrea. Does that mean they're no longer available through YouTube? No, they're on YouTube as well. So the library keeps them for two years, uh, also posts them on YouTube. So they should be on. I think the last one that's on is Shendell Beers. I believe Shendell's, Shendell's reading is on, is on YouTube. We're a little behind, so we're still in the process of catching up because this video auger videoing was something that we've had to pick up on the committee. So we're just getting up to speed on that. Uh, thanks, thanks that I want to make uh, one to the city of Milwaukee. I think you know that the city of Milwaukee does support the series and. We are absolutely uh, delighted about that. Secondly, to the Letting Library. We are a committee of the Letting Library, and uh, the library is very supportive. We're in our 13th season, and they've been supporting for 13 years. So that's terrific. And finally, we do have a Milwaukee Poetry Series committee. And Emmett and Dan are here. So can we give them a hand? I'm, I'm, I'm standing, they're both over there sitting. Uh, we have uh, five other members on the committee, it's a committee of eight. But as you know, you don't have things that happen unless you have a group of people working on it. So we are very, very happy about that. Um, I'd like to welcome our Oregon Poet Laureate, Amerita, who is with us tonight, right here to my left, Alan Peterson. So, Thank you very much uh, for being here. We do have two future readers, uh, Don Colburn, who's going to be reading next month, and Judith Montgomery. Don's back here. And Judith Montgomery, our, our November and December readers. Yeah, let's give them a hand. So thank you both for being here. I'd like to remind everybody about silencing your telephonic devices. Uh, if you would, that's beepers, pagers, smartphones, uh, and and so forth. If if you would, I'd like to say just a word about uh, upcoming events. You've heard that uh, Don Colburn is going to be our reader in uh, November. We are sponsoring a workshop with uh, Annie Lightheart, and she's going to be doing a workshop on writing Ruby, and that's going to be November second. The invitation is going to be out for it tomorrow. So if anybody wants more information about that, um, please see me after this reading. Uh, we're also, we concluded our first Friday readings, which we do in partnership with St. John the Evangelist, May through October. So we've just concluded that, but we are going to be having an open mic 
on November 6th, first Wednesday in November. That's going to be here, and the theme is going to be autumn, autumn, fall. And of course, you don't have to read around that theme, but you're invited to do that. So I've been very excited about this reading tonight, and we are delighted to, uh, to have Matthew here. Uh, his recent collection, Small Gods, won the 2019 Oregon Book Award in Poetry. His first book, Translation, was chosen by Jane Hirschfield for the 2014 WIC Poetry Prize. His poetry and essays have appeared in or are forthcoming from numerous journals, including The Believer, Poetry, The Southern Review, Virginia Quarterly Review. He's the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the C. Hamilton Bailey Oregon Literary Fellowship, the Stanley P. Young Fellowship in Poetry from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and a Writers in Residence Fellowship from the James Merrill House. This past summer, he served as the 43rd, 43rd Dartmouth Poet in Residence. We've been looking forward to this, and would you join me in welcoming our poet for the evening, Matthew Minicucci. Matthew. Thank you, Tom. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you for having me. It's lovely. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Is always the question you have to start with, right? Uh, so here's the plan. I want to read a little bit from my first book, Translation. I don't get a chance to read from it all that much anymore. I don't know. We have so many great writers in the room. I don't know if you have this feeling that occurs where all of a sudden you're like, I don't ever want to read from that book again. You're like, I'm done with that book. I don't, I don't want to sort of think about it. I had that moment very recently, um, but I've come out of it. And so now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot more about that book. Uh, and so I want to read a little bit from it. I think that'll be fun. I'm going to read some from Small Gods, which, uh, as you just heard, won the Oregon Book Award. And then as a great special preview, I'm going to read three poems um, from the next book that I've just started sending to press. So we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Um, all right. So translation. So I... Translation was a book, I have, so my story about this, so Jane Hirschfield chose this book, which was amazing, almost universally because I got to hang out with Jane Hirschfield, who's um, just a genuinely amazing poet and a genuinely amazing person. Uh, she called me and was like, we want your book, we're excited, you won, you won this prize. I'm like, oh, that's amazing, that's a life changing. She's like, I don't like the title. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, she suggested the title Forgiveness. I th think now, in retrospect, I really love that. At the time, I was like, I don't know if I could pull that off. I was like, I think Jane Hirschfield could pull that off. I'm not sure if I could pull it off. So, but, um, but I think she may have been right, that this was a book thinking about forgiveness. So this was a book really looking at mm, the dissolution of my, my nuclear family. I'm a child of divorced parents. And a lot of that is, is this, this book. So I want to start with the first First major poem in the book is called A Whale's Heart. There's a sadness that smells like rose water. It's my father's. Hands on the receiver, his voice, how his own father just can't find the words anymore. If you give him time, he says, like a slow climb, the single stroke engine sputtering, spilling oil, falling behind. When you're deaf, sometimes you just stop Listening, I understand how sometimes it snows inside the skull, how much like wind, like nothing. How lovely these fingerless gloves sewn. How inevitable. My grandfather once said, you can hear a whale's heart from over two miles away. How much sound must dissipate through the wavering quiet, the medium how large the ventricles must be, how in the old country his family distilled the petals pulled from their rose garden as drink or drug or perfume applied to his own father's ears each night before prayers, how the burns had come in a blacksmith's fire, how small the scar left, 
how easy to see that what was lost. The lilac and the bee. I was just a boy when my mother was born. Again, arms open like wings, triumphant in each step away from me. I was just a boy, you see. I couldn't run very fast. I couldn't chase down her car like the dog we left to bay in the kennel. And it was a good death. The week the lilacs bloomed each year like mayflies that only find romance in flight, only catch our eye when they fall. Some things live for years below the surface. Some buds find the perfect shade of purple on a late April day. Some I rip off and cut and shape with a penknife till green switch is wooden sword. It's play, you see. It's preparation for the real thing. Lilac is soft, it dents and chips at even the slightest threat of violence. Lilacs, you should know, are my mother's favorite flowers. The buds, small fragments of the whole that smell sweet, hide brambles and bumblebees so large you could swat them with a baseball bat. And they were an offering to her each May, the small glass vase, the water, and the stems. Once my mother found a bee floating in her vase and she dropped it, she freed the bee to float downstream towards my chair. Get rid of that horrible thing, she said. She didn't know I had put it there because I thought the flower would live forever if a bee remained to guard it, pollinate it, to nest deep within it. It's easy to catch a bee. You just slap it to the ground and then you hold it between your thumb and forefinger until the struggle stops. I didn't understand. The body of a bee is so much like the body of a boy. Tiny wings, warning colors, hours spent on the smallest bodies of water, a hand dug pond, a puddle in the sidewalk. Such a small body on the surface of such a small body needs no boat. It can never get lost. It can never be overtaken by waves. It's always right out front, floating, held tight in the dying folds of a lilac flower. And by tomorrow, the dark petals will have washed away. The bees moved on to a rose bush by the garden, cone flowers planted in the neighbor's garden. But the soft stems of the lilac bush, flowerless until it warms and then cools and warms again, will call to the neighborhood boys to cut and rip them away to fashion swords or spears or any other manner of playful weapon. So one of the names, the reason I brought up this naming sort of fiasco at the beginning was one of the original names of this book was On Anger. It's not really angry enough to be called On Anger, um, which is a really great point to have Jane Hirschfield tell you or an editor tell you. Um, but there is a poem called On Anger and I consider it sort of the centerpiece poem of the piece. Um, I'm taking the term on anger. So when I was in school, I studied classical languages. Uh, and this is taking its name from Seneca's piece on anger, where he's explaining all the reasons one shouldn't be angry. But he's sort of angry while he's doing it, as far as I can tell. So um, that got me thinking, what if I wrote a poem about anger that was angry? <laughs> what would happen then? What if I told you some truth. Uh, and so this poem came out of it. It's a poem in six parts. Um, I'll just hold up a finger to tell you when we move to the next part. It's called On Anger. Have I told you about the day that my mother left? I guess in some ways I don't need to. It's a wicker story, all straw and knots, older than dirt, always ready to spark. I think as the years passed, she missed our lilac bush most. Scented candles replaced visits, sickness wafted in the smells. If I told you that I was a bee and she something else entirely, what would you say? What I would say is by the end, she hated our house, the rips and the couch, how I couldn't help but pinch away flecks of foam. 
You know, some new owner has since painted it red. Seems appropriate. Fire, flames, the farmhouse you dreamed about. When it was ours, it was blue. It burned that much hotter. I was broken once. Not the way you might expect, not just fingers or thumbs, things that seem to splinter when you're a child. Those can be bound together for stability. This was a hand grabbing the back of my neck and my face against a parked car. At the hospital, a nurse found paint on my teeth. She said, look, mouth confetti. And I saw it, fluorescent funhouse, such blue scratched enamel. I just wasn't strong enough, you know? People have these images of fights, parry, thrust, a dance of geometric shapes, but it isn't like that. That which can be held, is held, and will not be relinquished. Like sinking, the softest parts of you go under first, and the rest follows. Vermilion, verisimilitude, veritas, veritas, veritas. Fuck it. I try to be honest, but inevitably someone asked me about my grandmother. The old man beat her for 20 years, and then one day, terrible stillness, as if he had forgotten his own shaking hands. Towards the end, she lied to me about love. The Apache or the Micmac who was meant to be my grandfather. Stories like stepladders to something other than quiet. And then one day, as the last drop leaked from her mitral valve, she said she was just so damn tired. Inevitable. And the old man performed compressions. He tried once more to bring her back with force. Later, he said he had what was left burned and buried it unmarked beneath his black tupelo, that the next time I passed through, I was free to visit. The cardinals and the tanagers would return soon. Today, I argued with the roof of my car. Cigarette burns, the fist's concavity, a pointless object of space, proving nothing is immutable. Once, during a storm, my vehicle spun towards an oncoming truck. Such spit choked sublime. Foam torrent, finally an end. Realize it's all just molecules merging, a car with a truck, a fist with a plastic shell, but parity is not proof of symmetry. The water, almost amniotic, pulled me away, weeping. And at the last moment, there's control and everything goes back to normal. No highway crucifix or cotton rose mallow to hang from it. No reunited parents consoled by the, cons by the closed casket. No picture crudely taped to the mirror's edge. The truth is, I have no mirrors in my house. I can't stand the sudden reversal of these broken things, the strange sickness of seeing me the way that you do. Have you ever read Seven Against Thebes? People talk about war like it's a whisper, the low thrum of the inevitable. All these battles within walls of stone and flesh. It's some terrible quiet that pains us. The sound of approaching riders like that night of the thunderstorm, an hour in the oculus. How the town could have burned in the distance and we would have forgotten. My parents always like pettish kings. How we forget these lips. How dark a late afternoon can be. I was just a boy, you see. I thought the gesture these arms should make was a cross, as if it was the only way to feel the heart's slow metronome, or to hold back this wave that's waiting to wipe out the world. It's hard to do six. <laughs> six. There's so little to be said today. In a white field sits a red house, no bigger than my childhood room. It fled, but I've tried to hold on. Just like Harold Mattingly said of translating Horace's odes, it's all ropes of sand. Or really, he said, shit. I really don't mean to be so kind.
Sometimes it's only the cavities that remind us. With the lilac bush, there were infinite expectations. The split stem of it, the useless flower that stinks and stinks of it. This thing that dies before any meaning is met. My mother said sometimes it's just sap and suck. The sky in relation to your chin, the beast that presses against your heart. Sometimes we leave the house without warning and we can't find our way back. Sometimes we slam the door to be heard. But sometimes, just sometimes, we want to make sure it's fastened tightly so that nothing follows. Thank you. So, awkward transition between books. Um, whereas translation was a lot about family, small gods is very much about one big idea, which is maybe not a good idea for a book. <laughs> but, um, I grew up in 12 years of Catholic school. Um, I went to church all the time. I was a very Catholic school boy. In fact, how I'm dressed right now, except for the jeans. No one would have ever let me get away with jeans. Um, was very much my Catholic school life. Um, that's how I know how to tie a tie, and I do it for everybody. But um, part of my instruction in loss part of all of our instruction and loss was losing people who were important to me. Um, but the way I learned to deal with it was through religion. And then I threw all that aside. I went to college at a public school. I was like, never again. And then I started thinking more about science. Now, I'm the child of scientists. Both of my parents are scientists. So this was not the household I grew up in, but this was the school that I went to. So at home, science, logic, at school, God, and God, and God, right? And that was everything. So this book is about how religion and how science come together as two separate but perhaps equal ways of thinking about loss and perhaps dealing with loss. So I uh, would love to start with the first poem, which I'm going to try to do for you from memory because I try to always do it from memory. So um, there, are book, there are poems in this book that are named after books of the Bible. This is my all-time favorite Pauline epistle, Paul's letter to the Romans, which if you studied this in any way, you know was unbelievably important to Martin Luther in thinking about the concept of grace, uh, a thing freely given always from God. So uh, this is called Paul's, Paul's letter to the Romans. What if I told you that desire is something with lips? Something ancient, cavernous, filled with tepid water and transparent, eyeless fish? What if it wasn't skin or its lack that pushed you away? What if loss was something more than your bronze gods, porcine and bright, the stink of some world hanging off the end of a spear? What if I could offer you doubts, long sands, burnt temple, the body lost to the sap of trees? What if the small flash of emptiness at the back of the knee fired the heart of this king, this graceful thing, and each time you approached, there was given love, like an oil lamp? What if less or fewer, or nothing could be augured. And birds were, next to him, the closest thing. What if no flesh was asked for, except this, or this, or this night caught in the belly that bore it? What if all this time you were already home. What would you be willing to burn to light it? Proverbs. Let's not talk about how much has been left on the porch, the rocks in the vase, the case made each day no better with time. In rhyme, I always hate myself. 
drowning in a shallow pool, just to be thought a fool again, fooled, of course, in the long, dark spool of night. Consider how a hand brushes against another and how that is almost nothing. This morning, a cat walks carefully through the white yard, unsure of each step, and yes, she reminds me of you. I want to take her in. Eat this, the body says, and stay. In the end, any breath left is wasted, so let me be clear. Tracks in the snow indicate at least some life, and this is intimate. How what's empty is always cavernous, no matter how delicately placed. So fairly recently, a couple, couple years ago, but it feels very recent, um, my grandfather passed away. One of the complicated parts about writing, by the way, the greatest compliment I ever received was from my teacher, my, my advisor, my mentor, the person who I loved very much in life. Bridget Kelly was my teacher who I studied with. And when she passed away, it was, it was, it was an irreversible sort of thing, but the kindest thing she ever, she said many kind things to me. The idea of being Bridget's student was, she had this beautiful farmhouse in Illinois. Uh, and if you haven't read her work, please go seek it out. Um, Song is perhaps one of the greatest books ever written, as is The Orchard. Um, as is, quite honestly, to the place of trumpets, her first book, though you can't find it because she never wanted it to be reprinted. Um, but she had this beautiful farmhouse, and when you said, Bridget, oh, I wrote these poems, or I'm working on this book, can I, like, can I come talk to you about it? She'd be like, come to the farmhouse. And she would have you sit, and she would just sit and listen to you read. Uh, and we would just sit and read. I remember many days where the sun would just set as I read every poem that I could bring in my packet to Bridget Kelly. Um, and one of the nicest things she ever said to me while I was working on this book, a very early version of this book a long time ago, um, was... Matt, you write a poem about your grandparents that isn't cliche. <laughs> and I was like, that is the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. <laughs> um, my grandfather passed away. I, I dedicated this book to, to him in a lot of ways, and a lot of these poems are dedicated to him. Make it clear the grandfather that's being spoken of very negatively in the poem that you heard in translation is different than this grandfather, obviously. Two grandfathers, so important to know. But. This comes out of the last thing that my grandfather ever said to me, um, which was the line, then my ship will be gone. I have no idea what that means. He was not making a lot of sense at the time, but I decided to write a poem around it. So, it's called Black Ship Swept. When my grandfather says, then my ship will be gone, I have no response. And so I mourn just as my mother taught me to do, just as she was taught by her mother and each mother before that, a clue held taut, as when I said, I miss you, and to this, you had no response, only that the ship has been swept, 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 sweeps away. I know, but I don't know what to say. What I'm looking for is here by the coffee and cornflakes, always that there is another cave, lit but still dark like remains, or simple inertia of a swaying body sculpted to simulacra from ashes, as if by a mother's heavy hands. Paul's letter to the Philippians. About sadness, all epistles are written in Greek the unknown angle in each sigma, how the alpha always implies the missing aleph. Perhaps there's nothing more to say about the dark, how the night would rather be apostle to emptiness than minister to wind, wind as that ubiquitous and hollow gift, wind like tidal water living in the pinna of the ear. It may sing sorrow as salvation's undertow or lift blood from a stone already washed by foam, or it may do nothing of the sort. Now, here at the end, we talk about doubt like Thomas. Yes, blessed are those who believe without seeing, but blessed more are those who must accept the slivered hangnail of this proof when pressed deep within the cavities of their own flesh.
This one takes uh, uh, its title from the very end of the book of Job. The earth is called an old man full of days. In the end, everything turns out right. Like the last 10 verses of Job, where rings are given in supplication and apology, where sheep reappear in fields and stand bleeding next to a thousand yoke of oxen, where the latter days are blessed even more than the former, where even ghosts of lost children stand exhumed by the voices of new ones, more fair than the first. In this ancient language, there is one meter for heated debate and a second for lament. There has never been any consideration of another. So I want to read a couple of pieces from the, um, the science section. The science section, very technical term, science section. Um, so the centerpiece of this book is one poem for every letter of the Greek alphabet because A, got a lot of time on my hands. Um, but B is a thing I had always wanted to do the question was why and what would be the purpose. So every one of these poems, all of the scientific concepts that you hear, all of the technical considerations, natural scientists, astronomy, everything that's happening is drawn directly from concepts that are represented by the letter form itself. Um, so if you were to calculate X, Y, Z, you would in some sense be using this as a variable. And part of the thing I want you to remember while you're listening to it is again, it's a book about loss. So the speaker is really thinking, if I could figure out this one thing, if I could solve for this X, then maybe that one thing would lead me on a path to solving something else. And that's really sort of where the speaker's at in this. Uh, and that's important to remember. Uh, the speaker is as unknowledgeable about these concepts as you are. He, he or she is just seeking. Uh, as much information as possible. So I think that's important. So first one, uh, Moo, not M-O-O, -O, though that would be super great. Uh, M-U instead, M-U, the letter Moo. Orbital mechanics, really. The motion of this body, any body, to the constant pull of the George Washington Bridge, its star-lit toll booths. On the Henry Hudson Parkway, dead leaves move like lost children. Reluctantly, they share the stale air. For all elementary particles, X is true. X is most likely decay or the loneliness of separation from this atomic life. It's natural to find yourself in the background radiation or to understand relativistic speeds in New York traffic. The exit ramp considers the nature of a single dimension. I consider the narrow chain of cars pulled through city parks like kite strips. In linguistics, mora is a single unit of syllabic weight. I consider yelling at the yellow cab to add more syllabic weight to my overall point. I remind him that mora has no etymological relationship to mores, our simple ways, our virtues, our values. The small man has no mores. I think perhaps I can handle no more. The woman at the toll booth takes my small change and my large bills. She licks her fingers as she counts each folded corner. She stares at me as if I was her one millionth customer. A side note about that poem, I'm told there are no longer toll booths on the Henry Arts and Park Parkway. Gotta rip it out of the book. Can't, can't read it anymore, no more, no more toll booths, doesn't work. Uh, this one's called New, New, and New. Freedom or fission? Or both, of course. Of course, of course. Of course it varies to some degree. Distributions arise, how to part with this or parry that, how to calculate the number of dimensions in this domain. You say variance and I say divergent, and then we say nothing at all. Perhaps connection is periodic, a sine wave oscillating in some smooth, repetitive pattern. Wake, sleep, deep water. Wake, sleep, deep water. Inertia is resistance, first, before all other things, but we know this. I've said it a thousand times, do I have to say it again? Volatility, sensitivity, derivative of the option value, 
with respect to the underlying asset. A door, for example. How it's not a true anomaly. How it swings open in the summer and even the smallest amount of wind. Precipitation and reaction. The periapsis of a sundress wandering around the house picking lemon mint. A confession, I have never understood celestial mechanics. A corollary, the door, I never did get around to fixing it. <laughs> Last one from this book and then a couple of new things for you. It's called Omicron. We don't talk about it, but there's an order of operations to leaving. Calculate, divide, deal with the variables. Taping the bottom of each box before the top, for example. Of course, it's all just random. What side we choose. Just where we decide to make our mark. We're foolish, you and I. And we do foolish things. When you told me about him, foolish him, I could only respond in the vocative. Oh. Oh. Oh, Micron. Oh, Mega. The smallest of things and the biggest. The furthest star in any constellation group is still brighter than anything you've ever imagined, but is only punctuation to the sky. Giant, fiery, and ancient punctuation. Eventually, perhaps inevitably, we arbitrarily approach the limit of this function. We can try to find where there's still growth if and only if there exist positive integers, but we both know the argument is tending towards infinity. All simpler functions seem spent. Sufficiently large and suitably close, it seems, once again, we're left with X. All right, awkward transition again. <laughs> so, what is the new book about? Well, I'm glad you asked. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, here's the thing, and again, for all of my amazing writers in the room, how many times have you been working on something and you're like, I kind of know what this is about, feel like I know where I'm going, and then it turns out to be about something completely different? And you're like, son of a... <laughs> What happened? So this is a book that started with a lot of different projects and it turned out to be a book that was a lot more about toxic masculinity in a lot of ways. So I grew up, as you can tell from the poems, in some level of toxicity. Um, and I was thinking back very much when I was working on this about the fact that violence was a very, um, was an easy thing to grab for is the best way I can think to tell you. Um, it was so ingrained into every part of my life. If, if somebody gave me crap at school, my father said, then you go in and you hit them as hard as you can. And you grit his teeth. My, my father does this teeth gritting thing. Um, and so it did. Um, quite a lot, which is why, even to this day, um, I have bad orthodontics. Because um, anyone who's ever been in a fight knows that uh, it doesn't always work out in your favor. Um, so. One of the things I was thinking about was this ubiquity of violence, um, how it was just always there, something that could be picked up without even thinking about it. Um, so each of these poems is from a series called, um, it's called Stage uh, Weapons and Other Dramatic Objects. Stage Weapons and Other Dramatic Objects. And one of the thoughts is that there are these weapons um, that are around us all the time, but without thinking, we don't even see them in our daily lives. Um, and so these objects are all taken from what might be on a Greek tragic stage, because I'm a classicist, had to do it. Uh, so they're all named after some object that you would just see gracing the stage, but it would become so ubiquitous you wouldn't even think about it. So for example, the first one I'm gonna give you is uh, the Homeric word sakos, which is one of many words for shield. Shields would be all the time, they would be everywhere. So it would not be all that strange to think about that. One note about this before I start, um, all of the poems in this book are contrapuntal, meaning they're, they're in these collimated forms. So you can read it down on the left side, you can read it down on the right side, or you can read it across. 
all three readings should work. I'm going to read you all three readings in a row, and I will try to speed up as I go to sort of indicate the intensity of that particular thing. I think I'm only going to read two of them in an effort to make sure I don't take up too much of your time. Um, but we'll definitely do Sackos, which is shield. So left, right, across. And you should be able to hear it when it comes together. On this newly fashioned shield, portent rather than pity, my grandfather said bronzed as broken bones, bodies forget. Every day a holy water index finger like lions that fall upon them. You can't save anything. Not because I could, but because I would have to look at the shield's slow patina, green as day, the mouth tries to say I am old. There are stars tonight, but I do not remember even one constellation. The story is wrong-sighted, hanging on strapped arms. What's the point in pictures when loss is left lying in a road? You never fulcrum to pivot pain away from the center of a field, savage straight horn cattle. You can't save the truth. I never wanted children. Find them by the side of the road every day here. Spores spilled from the fruit body. Though my eyes are young, I know I do not recognize even one constellation. On this newly fastened shield, the story is wrong-sided, hanging on portent rather than pity strapped arms. What's the point, my grandfather said in pictures, when loss is left lying in a road, when loss is bronzed as broken bones, bodies left lying in a road. You never forget. Every day a holy water fulcrum to pivot pain away from the index finger, like the center of a field, savage lions that fall upon straight horned cattle. You can't save them. You can't save anything. The truth. I never wanted children, not because I could find them by the side of the road, but because I would have to look every day here at the shield's slow patina, green as day, spores spilled from the fruit body. The mouth tries to say, I am old, though my eyes are young. I know there are stars tonight, but I do not remember. I do not recognize even one constellation. I take it back. I want to read all three of them. <laughs> Sorry. I hope that's all right. <laughs> the next one is called Akmon, which is anvil in Homeric Greek. Anvil. Uh, grandfather is the son of a blacksmith. Also um, was a very good blacksmither in his own right. Again, left, right, across. Accusative, of course. Direct object, threnody in the Greek meek sounding loss, smallest piece of the mind's deep blue sound, here, fettered away in a forge. I admit my fear of this inevitable loss. In Typhon's song, over and over, refrains control. I mourn the incus, anvil, in cudere, to beat or strike, which seems right in the soupy spring of day. Nothing left like a sparkling bit of flecked lead, some new knotty suit interrupting the sleet just planted years away from taking root. Of sound's transitive verb, it's a dirge. Whale song, W-A-I-L, or whale song, W-H-A-L-E, or some imperfect soft cleft my grandfather heard nothing of. He would point to his ear, shake his head, gloss over the long nights of tinnitus being unable to regain the vulgar tongue, but actually there's so much that I'm struck by. Simple plans left in the ear spin or the dot spot lot dust I'm afraid of, dusk like some cusp, green carpet suburban summer. Tree, yes but so impossible to take back now. Accusative, of course, direct object of sounds, transitive verb. It's a dirge, threnody in the Greek, meek sounding whale song or whale song or some imperfect loss, smallest piece of the mind's deep blue soft cleft my grandfather heard nothing of. 
Sound here fettered away in a forge. He would point to his ear, shake his head. I admit my fear of this inevitable loss. Gloss over the long nights of Tanias' and Typhon's song. Over and over, refrains being unable to regain control. I mourn the Incas anvil in the vulgar tongue, but actually kudere, to beat or strike, which seems right. There's so much that I'm struck by simple plans in the soupy spring of day, nothing left in the ear spin or dot spot lot, left like a sparkling bit of flecked lead dust. I'm afraid of dust like some cusp, some new knotty suit interrupting the green carpet suburban summer tree. Yes, a seed just planted years away from taking root, but so impossible to take back now. Last one. Thank you very much for listening. This is my absolute favorite Homeric word, because I'm a huge nerd, and I have a favorite Homeric word. It's oxeus, which can mean one of two things, the strap of a helmet or the bolt of a door. That's a poem in and of itself. I'm not even sure if I wrote the poem. Um, the other thing you should know for this to work is that my mother was a soldier. So, helpful to know left, right, across. Maybe it's too early for glow, slow as a cloud slung, like what a soldier might carry home. I'll never understand why my mother, for example, carried a set of latrine tools, mosquito netting, a cat that wouldn't leave her side, her infidelities. She carried those too, like volcanic stones that which impossibly formed inside the open mouth of mountains, mountains of what one might choose to take. She left our house one day, a bolt against a red door, and never came back, not once more to gather blank. The May lilacs, vulgar in their epithet, common gift despite only brief flowers, simple leaves, I understand no eaves in the armor, house filled with the dead and spent whirls. There is nothing incandescent about one March afternoon when my mother left, like she created nothing important before calmly locking the door. Maybe it's too early for glow, slow as she left our house one day, a cloud slung like what a soldier might carry, a bolt against a red door, and never came back home. I'll never understand why. Now once more to gather blank. My mother, for example, carried the May lilacs, vulgar in their epithets, a set of latrine tools, mosquito netting, common gift despite only brief flowers, a cat that wouldn't leave her side, simple eaves. I understand, no. Her infidelities, she carried those eaves in the armor, house filled with the dead too, like volcanic stones in spent worlds. There is nothing incandescent about that which impossibly formed inside one March afternoon when my mother left like the open mouth of mountains, mountains of what she created. Nothing important one might choose to take before calmly locking the door. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Should I? Is anybody? Any? Yeah. Hi. So the, the project started out as a choral, sort of chorus project. I was thinking about, so the, 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 the book was originally designed as a Greek play, and so there's this entire chorus section. Um, and I basically took the form that I was using in the chorus section, which was using multiple voices as one, uh, and decided I should probably just do that for the whole thing, which took a very long time. I think, as I said, I'm on version 28. Uh, and that's been maybe three and a half, four years, which maybe isn't a long time for, for certain books. But um, I think the other place it came from was my other teacher when I was in grad school was Time But Jess. Uh, it was an interesting combination if you ever had a chance to read Time But Jess. 
Um, but he worked in contrapuntal forms all the time, and he asked us in grad school to work in contrapuntal forms. So it was something that was always in the back of my head, I think. It seemed to be appropriate for, for this particular project. Who do you think has influenced you? Oh, man. That's kind of a two-part question. Yeah. yeah. So who's influenced me? Yeah. And maybe who have I read? In, or who am I reading now and who's influenced me? Well, the two people that I've already mentioned, obviously, who are my teachers, Bridget Kelly and Tyne Bajess, were huge influences. Strangely, Jane Hirschfield also became a big influence, even though I don't think I read anything like her. Um, but I also don't think I read anything like either of those two people either. Um, so maybe that's all the, all the way it is. My, my entry into uh, poetry was actually um, Jim Tate was my sort of was the poet that I first heard. He taught at the University of Massachusetts where I was an undergrad and I just sort of wandered into a, into a reading one time and he was effing hilarious. Um, and it was the strangest thing because I didn't know a poem could be hilarious, as you can tell. Not very funny um, in the poems, but I think I'm okay funny like in real life. Um, so it was interesting that it never really happened in the poetry. Maybe someday that book will happen. But I think with Jim and honestly that same reading, uh, Dean Young was there as well. Um, who, and by the way, Jim Tate was Dean Young's hero. So you had this sort of long line of these people who were sort of hero worshiping each other. Um, and I got to see them read together, and I was on the floor laughing. And it really opened up something inside of me a lot, where I suddenly felt like um, maybe I never became funny as a poet, but I was willing to make the move that maybe doesn't make sense on um, first or second or third thought. Um, I was willing to ride my own mount, maybe, and to, to, to think how fast I think about it. But um, there, I would say those are two of the people who really because I just went and just read everything. And this was right before I went to grad school. And then when I went to grad school, people like uh, Bill Olson was a big, um, was a person that I thought about a lot. Um, and then eventually became friends with, which was amazing. Uh, currently, what am I reading right now? Ilya Kaminsky's book, Deaf Republic, which just was a, be named as a finalist for the National Book Award, is genuinely amazing. Jericho Brown's The Tradition, also named as a finalist for the Book Award. Um, both of those books were two of my favorite books of the year, and I thought that they were just absolutely brilliant. I also want to have my students, I, I'm teaching at Linfield College now, which is amazing and a lovely place, and um, I'm having my students read Analicia Sotelo. Uh, she wrote a book last year called Virgin, which is amazing. She has these mythology poems, but she also has a lot of Catholicism. She's thinking about images of the Virgin, um, both in uh, Greek mythology, but also in sort of Catholic mythology, and how it's really, really, really hard to be a person who has to unsexualize themselves while you're feeling sexual, which I think is absolutely fascinating, and she writes about it just genuinely brilliantly. I, we're talking about it tomorrow morning when I have my, my intro to creative writing class, so pray that they're excited about it, because I'm hopeful that they will be, because I'm sure anyone in the room who's a teacher, you know how hard it is that if you teach something that you like, and you walk in there and they don't like it, uh, you can try to keep your critical tie on, you know, and try to think about it. What are we, what are we doing at the lesson today? What are we specifically talking about? But inside, there's a tiny bit of disappointment that they're not just like, this is amazing. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> any any other anything else I can answer? Yeah. yeah. That's a lovely question. Yeah. Do I have a process for writing? So yes. Over the years, it's become I don't want to say pr crystallized. Maybe it, it moves on occasion, but fairly crystallized. Um, I try to write around 500 words a day. Um, if I'm working on a prose project, I'm working on, on my first novel right now. I'll write more, but I think of that very separately. Um, but just for poetry, I try to get down 500 words of whatever. And then my process is to put it aside, and then after I've got enough pages, usually, you know, if I do that for three or four months, when we get to the summer or we get to some time that I have on my own, I'll take all those pages and I'll cross out everything that doesn't make sense to me. So for me, the writing process is always this sculpting, chiseling process. 
So I have all of this information and I cut out everything that doesn't look like what the poem maybe wants to be. I have no idea what the poem wants to be when I start doing that, but sometimes I'll see a line or a phrase and I'll say, maybe this poem is actually about this. Or maybe I was thinking about this this day and now I'm far enough away from it that I can actually sort of do the work necessary to make it happen. And then once I have that, I put all of that aside and then a few months later, I go ahead and I start trying to form those into poems, which I think is probably a lot of people's process is sort of these multiple things. So for me, I'm always working on, there's always writing going on, there's always editing going on, and there's also like always final editing going on. That way if I am like really mad at one of those things, I can stop. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm writing terribly today. Oh, okay, back to editing, right? Like, so there's always, I basically have designed my whole process under the fact that I'm, uh, I have a very short attention span. So, <laughs> so yeah. Hope that helps. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Anything else? Uh, if not, Matthew's going to be here for a bit. I am here. Do you have books? Yes. Books to, uh, I do have some books. Book yeah, I'm all out of Small Gods. It just ran out. I'm sorry. Um, but I do have copies of my first book. And I have copies of my first chat book, um, if you're interested. So you can Please help yourself to the refreshments. That. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they're there for. In about 10 minutes. <laughs> We have to put the room back in the sure. sure. with the tables in a square. Okay. So, 10 minutes or, or Sounds good. we're going to start doing it. Let's get back here. Thank you very much. Great.